Hallelujah. It's so good to have Tracy with us. Tracy, come up. Give him a hand clap. He's our school headmaster. He's our school teacher and administrator. And again, we're starting seventh uh, grade all the way through 12th grade. And so with school about to start, he wanted to share with us about our school. Amen. Give him one more hand clap. Amen. Praise the Lord. So I, th I think urchins comes from uh, English literature, street urchins. street urchins. Yeah, so I think that's where it comes from. So they were they're reading reading books back then that we no longer read. <laughs> At any rate, well, thank you for having me this morning. Uh, I'm Mr. Moran to my students, um, Tracy Moran um, to you all. And the headmaster of our school, Mountain Family Academy School of Dis Christian Discipleship. And uh, we've completed our first full year. This is the second time that I've started a school and been through year one, and it was much like the first one. I'm amazed that I made it, and I'm not prepared for the next one. So I never, never am. As soon as... Uh, as soon as summer comes, the, to me, the clock starts ticking on the new year. So um, I don't know if, if teachers relax during the summer, but I can tell you administrators do not. At um, any rate, we, we have one year under our belt. We've had some success. We've had some failure, such as life. Some adversity, some pressure testing, and... A refining of our vision. We began last year with an idea of what we were going to do and uh, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. So we adapt, we overcome and uh, one lesson that was driven home this year to me, it's not the first time I've had this lesson, by the way teachers learn in school that that frequently I frequently I think I might learn more than the students um, but one lesson that was driven home this year is we are a school of discipleship not a reform school and there's a world of difference between the two we're here for those who want it not for those who need it there's a need for a reform school, a pressing need, a need that keeps coming up. Every school that I've been involved in, there's, there's almost every year, there's parents that are desperate. We need you, this kid, fix them, right? They're broken, fix them. And I have a hard time saying no. Uh, but... That's a, different, that's a different calling. Reform is not training. It's not teaching. It's a snatching out of the fire. Okay? It's a rescue. It's a completely different focus, a completely different uh, environment, a completely different purpose. And it is a valuable purpose. It is much needed. And perhaps... You have a burden for that. Perhaps you have a burden for that. If so, I would encourage you to consider that perhaps God has given you a calling to start a reform school. Perhaps you should consider that. It is a calling. It's a high and lofty calling, but it's not my calling. And I have, I have had to learn yet again how to say no. It's not something, I don't like to say no. I like to say yes. But I have, I have learned yet again, thank you Jesus, I have to say, sometimes you got to say no. So I want to talk to you today about our school's vision. And I'm going to go far and wide. And you might wonder, where is he going with all this? But I hope, that in the end, you will see there, there was a method to my madness. So our school's vision 
is threefold. Train up a child in the way he should go, build a biblical worldview, and fulfill the Great Commission. So Proverbs 22.6 says this, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Notice with me that you're to train up. Training is intentional. It doesn't happen by accident. Training is something you can do for yourself, or it's something that someone can do to you. And if you've been to boot camp, you completely understand the second one, right? I could tell you some stories about the first day of boot camp. <laughs> I have told some of you some of my stories about the first day of boot camp. It is a memorable experience. I will never forget some things. And there are some things that I wish that I could forget. But it is an intentional thing. Something happens in boot camp. The military is expert at this. They have it refined. They take you in whatever condition you're in, and they say, we're going to start over. So the first part of boot camp is wiping all of that, all the you out of you. Okay? And then they put what they want in its place. And some people resist, but I, I never saw anybody win that battle. So they're experts at it. <clears throat> but it's intentional, so it can be done to you. Training is gaining knowledge and experience with a purpose in mind. <clears throat> There's a lot of training going on in our society today, lots of it. Notice also, train up a child in the way he should go. Notice that there is a way you should go. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. There's a way you should go, and there's a way you should not go. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We'd better pay attention to what Jesus just said. He's the way. There's only one way. There's no other way. There's this idea that all roads lead to heaven. No, they don't. <clears throat> Even rock and roll understands that there's a highway to hell and a stairway to heaven. <laughs> one, one is paved with good intentions and the other one requires sacrifice. Okay? So, <clears throat> there's a way to go and a way not to go. Notice that there's a way he should go. Talking about an individual. We all know that there's a corporate way, right? There's a way that we go together as the body. You're here right now doing it this way, right? But there's a way an individual should go too. James says in James 1, 5 through 8, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. So, when you ask for something from God, do not doubt that you will get it, right? Uh, that's, not, that's not what he said, though, is it? Let's go back and read it again. James said to ask God for wisdom without doubting, right? He didn't say that you can ask for whatever you want without doubting. There's this idea that whatever we ask, if we ask it without doubt, somehow we've obligated God to give it to us. That's not what the Bible says. So when we handle the Word of God 
We need to do it with great care and read what's there. Perhaps you thought, as I did for a very long time, that money is the root of all evil. That's not what the Bible says. That's what the world says. That's what the world is teaching right now as they raise up good little socialists. Okay? The Bible says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. There's a difference. So remember there's a way that seems right, but we need to be careful that we find that way, the way that, the way that is right, not the one that seems right. And notice also that if you live long enough, you will get old. You might want to plan for that. This is a lesson that yours yours truly did not learn. When I was growing up, it was during the Vietnam War. And so every night on the evening news, Walter Cronkite would tell us how things were. Things are going bad. Lots of guys are dying. Uh, This was the expectation of me and all my friends that once we got out of high school, it's off to Vietnam. Perhaps some of you remember the fixing to die rag. <clears throat> and uh, that, was a song that, I, that was a song that I learned as a kid. Whoopee, we're all going to die, right? So um, there was, I remember the Tet Offensive unfolding on TV. I remember my parents watching with great concern. I had a brother that was in the Marine Corps. And he went to Vietnam, and we all expected to go. And I expected to go there and die because my brother went there and died, came back in a body bag. So my expectation growing up was you're not going to make it to 18. You're not going to make it to 21. You're not going to make it to 25. You're not going to make it to 30. I'm at 62. I still have that. I still have that in me, but here I am. 62 years old, retirement is approaching or whatever, and I'm not prepared. <laughs> I'm not prepared. I don't, I don't, I comfort myself with the thought that retirement is not in the Bible, okay? <laughs> so, <clears throat> when I'm very, when I am ancient of days, I will be teaching little kids, probably, my old, my old English teacher uh, from high school retired and taught a preschool. And he said, this is, the best there, this is the best teaching there is. They're little and they look up to you like you're a god. And they listen to everything you say and they do what they tell you. And he said, this is awesome. I should have been doing this all along. <laughs> any rate, I may be doing that. If you train up a child in the way he should go, he will not depart from it. That's a pretty bold promise, don't you think? How come... Children who grew up in the church leave it when they get older. Maybe we are training them to go in a way that isn't the way they should go. Which raises a very important question. Whose responsibility is it to train up a child? I've had parents lay on me responsibility. I've seen people do it to churches, people do it to schools. Let's see what the Bible says. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and your gates. It's the parent's responsibility to train up the child. 
The church may help, the school may help, the family may help, but it's the parent's responsibility. And there's a reason why. When they're the most impressionable, when they're the most learning the most, you learn more in the first five years of your life than you will learn in the rest of it. It's amazing. You take this little helpless blob, right, that can't feed itself, can't dress itself, can't even, can't even sit up, can't hold up its head. It really unnerves me when people hand me a newborn in their head. I'm like, uh, when they can hold their head up, then you can hand it to me. Until then, no thank you. I don't want to break it, okay? <laughs> even with my own, I was very much always supporting the head. They learn so much in the first five years. They are learning machines. They're always learning. They're always learning, learning, learning. Beware. They're always learning. They're watching everything you do. They're learning from everything you say and everything you do. If you don't want your child to run away from you when they're older, do not play chase with them. You're teaching them to run away. Don't be angry with them if you say it's time for dinner or time for a bath and they're down the road. You taught them, okay? It's your responsibility. We can help you, but it's not my responsibility. So, they have the first, you have the first and primary influence in their life. So I want to say something to those of you that maybe you have a wayward child. <clears throat> maybe you feel like you botched the job. Does that mean there's no hope? I don't find that in the Bible. Jacob did a pretty terrible job of raising his brood. He had 12 of them. They were murderers. They, they, some of them had trouble with prostitutes. They were thieves. They wanted to kill their brother. They sold him into slavery. And by the way, he wasn't all that great to start off with. He was snotty and stuck up on himself and rubbing their, his brother's noses in the favor that Jacob showed to him, Right? But how did Joseph turn out? Pretty good. It seems like Jesse didn't put a lot of effort into his red-headed son, his youngest one, David, right? When Samuel came to anoint the next king of Israel, he brought out all of his sons except one, yep. right? He didn't, he, didn't have, he didn't look too favorably on him. His brothers didn't look on him very favorably. They're in battle, they're in war, and David brings them supplies, and they're like, what are you doing here? So, it doesn't seem like he had a very auspicious beginning, but I think he turned out okay. He was the greatest king Israel ever had, and more importantly, he was a man after God's own heart. So, it's not how you begin, it's how you finish. Maybe you didn't begin well, like me. I didn't begin well. Finish well. Amen. Run the race that's in front of you, not the one behind you. And remember this, prodigals have a way of returning. Yes. That's my favorite story from all the parables that Jesus told because I am one. I'm a prodigal. Ultimately, your child is on loan to you anyways. They don't belong to you. They, they're just on loan to you from God. So seek God's help and start fresh and go forward and believe. And if you lack wisdom, ask for it. God will give it to you. Seek His help to start doing your job instead of seeking to farm it out to somebody else. The second thing 
that we want to do in our school is develop a biblical worldview. So what is a worldview? It's not that difficult. It's just the way you view the world. Okay? Everybody has one. You started forming yours the moment you were born. It's naturally self-centered. And what does that mean? It means I can't see the world from any perspective but this one. I can't see it from yours. I can't see it from yours. I can see it from mine. So it starts with myself. The center of it is right here. Right here, looking that way. Okay, does that mean it's selfish? Left to my own devices? Yeah, it's going to be. But it doesn't have to be. You can expand your worldview. You can direct it. Out of all the people in the world, there's only one person you have any hope at all of changing, and that's you. And it's always under construction. You're always working on your worldview. It's always being modified. And let me tell you, there are some forces outside of you that are trying to modify your worldview today. Let me just toss out a few phrases and see if they ring a bell. Critical race theory. Climate change. Democracy is under attack. The World Health Organization Pandemic Treaty. Central Bank Digital Currencies. Diversity, equity, inclusion. Etc., etc., ad nauseum. Do you want God to save our country? Yes. So do I. We might need to recover the worldview that the founders had. Here's what John Adams said. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. There's a reason we are living in a post-constitutional society. There's a reason. The problem's not with the Constitution. The problem is, is that the people in our country don't have the worldview that is moral or religious. So if we want the Constitution to work, we've got to get that worldview back. Now, your worldview is based on something for many people, it's their experience. And here's a re some reasons why that's not the most reliable foundation. Your experience is limited by time, your lifetime, your inability to exist anywhere except the present. And you need to sleep, you need to eat, you need to work. You're limited by time. It's limited by location. You can't be in more than one place at one time. You can only see things from where you are. And you're limited by your own understanding. There's a limit to how much you can understand, how much you can know. And you can be deceived. But can I just point out to you, there's a place, there's a person who isn't, doesn't have any of those limitations. That's where we want to get our worldview. What kind of worldview do you want to have? I want one that's grounded in reality, that's accurate to what's really going on in the world, not just my perception. I want one that's of a timeless quality, that's going to be good today, tomorrow, and for all eternity. It's hard to conceive of eternity because we're stuck in time. But if you think of our life as an endless journey, and you're, you're on step one right now, this life. The next step is into eternity. You might want to make sure you make the right step. And it should help you get where you want to go. It should be useful. There's really only one place where you can get that kind of a worldview. Ecclesiastes 3.14 says, I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. 
Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it that man should fear before him. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying my counsel will stand and I will do all my pleasure. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Revelation 1, 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. That's where we want to get our worldview, from that place. The third thing that we want to do is fulfill the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. When you read the Bible, do you read through it or do you read it? There's a difference. There's value to reading through the Bible. You get the full counsel of God as opposed to cherry picking, right? But when we read it, we need to read it. When I was in AA, I had a sponsor and he would say to me, he would say, this is the big book. Read the black stuff. You're not ready to read between the lines. Just read the black stuff. Because we're all prone to read between the lines. So, what do we get from this? What can we see in this section of Scripture? Number one, Jesus has all authority. That makes Him the authority. And the Bible speaks to a great many things. If we want to know the truth of something... That's where we need to start. Not run there after everything else has failed. And we're to make disciples, not converts. There's a world of difference between the two. Basically, a disciple is a convert who wants to follow Christ. So you begin as a convert, and hopefully you move on into discipleship. Satan does not mind at all if you believe in Jesus. James 2.19 says, You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Lucifer believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And he's a devil. There is a kind of belief that that matters. <clears throat> Paul and Silas in the book of Acts are in the Philippi jail. <clears throat> They're praying and singing at midnight during the darkest hour and God comes and sets them free. But rather than running off, they stay to save the jailer and his family. Prayer changes you as much as it changes your circumstances. What do you want from God becomes what does God want from you? Acts 16, 30 through 34. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. We hear that a lot. It's a very popular message in our day and we hear it and we read through it and we move on. But notice the word believe. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now, when he had brought them into his house, he set food before him and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. The jailer really believed. He was moved to action. 
He changed his ways. He changed the way he was treating Paul and Silas. He didn't just believe, he believed. Sometimes that change happens quickly. That's not my testimony. Sometimes the biggest changes come after time. So, let me expand on that for a second. There, there's a lot of times that I sit in a church and somebody will give their testimony and say, I came to the Lord and then this and everything changed and so on. And you get the idea that there's only one way. That if it didn't happen to you that way, then you're not doing it right. Remember what I said earlier about how you start running isn't what matters? Finish well. That's what matters. He's not going to say, he's the, on the day that you see Jesus, he's not going to say, well, you know, you, you kind of blew it at the beginning. <laughs> you, you took a nosedive and you landed splat on your face and we really only have room in, on my team for winners. He's not going to say that. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. If you're not that today, let today be the day that you start to be that. You can't run the race that's behind you. You can run the one that's in front of you. Sometimes change, I think one of the biggest things that makes a difference about the change is this this idea of baptism. Okay? What does that mean? Baptize them... Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's a rite of baptism that one goes through to make a public declaration that they've committed to following Christ. But baptizo means to dip repeatedly, to immerse, to submerge, to cleanse by dipping or submerging, to wash, to make clean with water, to wash oneself, to bathe, to overwhelm. Are you overwhelmed? Are you being made clean? Are you washing yourself in the Word by immersing yourself repeatedly? Some stains take a little scrubbing. Teach them to observe all that Jesus commanded. Jesus has all authority. That makes him the authority. We want to know the truth of things, we better ask him first. Jesus has commanded. He told us to do things that are not optional. These are commands. Let me give you three, and there's there's great many more. Matthew 4.17, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 11:20. Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. So repenting is a command. It's the first one. That's the first one Jesus gave. Here's another one you don't often hear these days. Fear God. Luke 12, 4 and 5. And I say to you, my friends... Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do, but I will show you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. This is something that's seriously lacking in our day. Why does our country look the way it does? Why does our world look the way it does? I would say to you, Consider this. There's no fear. There's no fear of God. There's no fear that Jesus is coming again. He's coming again, but he's not going to be a little baby in a manger. We sang about our God is a lion, right? He's coming back as the king, the conquering king. Some people are going to have to give an account of every word that came out of their mouth. 
I don't know about you, but that makes me tremble a little bit. Mark Twain said, I, the, parts of, the parts of the Bible that I worry about are the ones I understand. Here's another command. Forgive, Mark 11, 25 through 26. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Doesn't sound like it's optional to me. One more thing. Jesus is with us. We often think that our circumstances are the problem. Paul and Silas were unjustly imprisoned. And they prayed and praised God and were not only delivered from prison, but delivered from their misery while they were still in prison. They could have concern for the jailer and his family and save his life because they knew that Jesus was with them. Corey Ten Boom was a Dutch Christian who helped hide Jews from the Nazis during World War II. You'd think that God would protect her family so that they could continue that work, but they were betrayed and arrested and sent to a concentration camp. Her father died in one and her beloved sister died in another. After the war, Corey went around preaching the gospel and told how God sustained her through her trials. She's a real fount of wisdom. If you want to be encouraged, I would say look up Corey Ten Boom quotes. She preached forgiveness, and then one day she was approached by one of her former guards after preaching about forgiveness, and she had to prove what she really believed. This is something she said about forgiveness. To forgive is to set a prisoner free and to discover the prisoner was you. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. The first thing that James says in his letter is in James 1, 2, and 4. My brethren... Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Do you want to be perfect and complete, lacking nothing? You might have to go through a trial to get there. We will have tribulation. It's guaranteed. Jesus said in John 16, 33, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Read the Bible. This world is headed for tribulation. In fact, we're already in it. I would encourage you on your own to read 2 Timothy 3. We live in perilous times. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. But if you read the end of the book, when I get discouraged, I go and read Revelation 21 and 22. That will perk you right up. What do our children need to navigate the world that we live in? They need to be trained up in the way they should go. They need a biblical worldview. And they need to move past conversion and into discipleship. They need to become disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that what we all need? The Bible's pretty clear we're headed for trouble. You can see the storm clouds. There was a movie last night. 
We're going to need to get a lot closer to God than we have ever been before. As it turns out, that's what we always needed. Oh, and one more thing. How do you build a worldview? We just did. Hey guys, can you just stretch your hands towards Tracy and we're going to pray for our uh, Christian school. Uh, it's a school of discipleship, amen? Amen. And uh, even last night, I don't know if you saw that movie, The Great Awakening, last night. It was pretty incredible, pretty eye-opening. And uh, on the way home, I, I said to Colton, I go, what did you think about that movie? He goes, it was good, Dad. And I go, really? That's all you had to say about it? He goes, well, I pretty much knew everything about that movie already. And I go, what? How did you know that? And he goes, Brother Tracy talks about it at school. <laughs> so isn't that amazing? So uh, the, the, the whole dynamic of that, one of the things that are lacking today in, in, in public education that we emphasize at Mountain Family Academy is the term critical thinking. Okay? And, and I'm, I'm going to flat out tell you, um, I'm not here to run down public education. Danny Norling is a school teacher, and, 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 and so we pray for our teachers in, in our public schools. Amen. Uh, I'm a product, no, of public education. I was, I was joking about that. I, Danny, I was joking about that. But, but here we really want to increase and intensify the dynamic of discipleship, growing in the Lord, having a biblical worldview, and then reproducing that in others. Amen? And so we're going to pray for our school. We're going to pray for Tracy. And literally, you pray about it. I, I, listen, I am a pastor today, and I am a born-again Christian today. Uh, my mom and dad uh, took me to church, uh, but I, did, I didn't go to a church with a youth group. There wasn't even a youth group in the church. And an, an Assembly of God woman that lived down the street about two blocks away that knew my mom and dad, called my mom and said, hey, could your son Paul go to youth camp, summer camp with our youth? Isn't that amazing? So you may know somebody that might need uh, to, to uh, mom or dad to talk to Tracy about their child coming to a Christian school. So anyway, let's pray for them. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we lift up Mountain Family Academy School, 7th through 12th grade. We pray, Father, that your hand of blessing would be on it. We pray that these children could grow and be discipled and be trained up in the way each one of them should go, Lord God. Father, if you're raising them up to go into a life of engineering, do so, Lord, or, or of uh, any other form, any other occupation, Lord. Father, if you're raising them up for ministry, if you're raising them up in governmental mantles, Father, you raise them up in the way they should go. And Father, we pray the anointing of the Holy Spirit be upon this school, Father God, that they would be educated with you being number one, Lord God. Father, and then academics, Lord, raise them up to a greater standard of academics. Father, we pray for Tracy right now, the headmaster, the administrator, the teacher of this school, Lord, that your anointing would be upon him, that, Lord, you would use him in a mighty way to disciple. Father, you would use him in a mighty way that, Father, those young men and young women would be raised up to be fruit bearers, Lord. They would ra be raised up to walk with the gifts of of the spirit in their lives God father that they would be raised up to go forward for Lord that they would be raised up as arrows in the quiver that they would be released and shot far and hit the target in the name of Jesus we give you praise and we give you glory you love the Lord give the Lord a hand clap today amen God bless you guys if you have any questions for Tracy he's here for you God bless you we'll see you next Sunday or next Wednesday night if you're in the youth, or next Thursday night at prayer. Amen. Monday night, yes, Monday night, tomorrow evening, 530 at the Capitol. God bless you. We'll see you. Thank you for reminding me, Tracy. Bless you.
YouTube Premium. Premium. 